Welcome. I'm Chris Martinson, and this is Peak Prosperity. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Martinson of Peak Prosperity, and we're here with another Featured Voices podcast. This is a really important one today. As you know, uh, a lot of what I do has been, up to this point in time, has been about problem definition. And I'm not going to go there, because I think everybody who's watching this is already familiar with what the problems and predicaments are, right? We've got global climate change and melting ice and running out of soil that's being turned into dirt and we've got oil issues looming in the future. We've got a runaway money system, all this stuff. It feels out of control. That's the problem definition, but the solution space, what what does that look like? We know that we're already in the fourth turning. We know that already institutional faith and trust in institutions is eroding. And we know that uh, we're in a period of great upheaval and change with a fractured population. So none of those are really great inputs to uh, to really begin to shift things at this point in time. So my view is that we're going to go through some more hardness, hard times, darkness, things like that before we get to the turnaround, but it's not too early to begin thinking about what that turnaround looks like. If you've been following me, you know, in my own small corner of the world, I'm creating a, a little oasis, a literal oasis where uh, in my own small way, uh, converting soil, uh, dirt back into soil and uh, working with my local community and, and building up the infrastructure I need so that I can be really additive to my community. So, so that's one thing that, that you could do. It's one, it's one thing I'm doing. So lots of people are searching for these kinds of solutions. With us today to talk about this in the solution space and what comes next, what comes after uh, the crumbling. You know, there's going to be a, a, a rebirth, a, a reemergence. So it's not too early to be thinking about, well, what does that look like? And I think if we're fair, we say a lot of the systems that we put in place aren't working for us. We're working for them. We are in service to money, not the other way around. It's bizarre, right? Um, and, and, oh, don't even get me started on how badly our health institutions uh, behave during this whole COVID crisis, uh, things like that. So the question becomes, if not that, then what? And that's what today's conversation is about with Charles Hugh Smith, prolific author, good friend of both myself and Adam, and a longtime Peak Prosperity contributor, and all around great guy. Um, his blog is Of Two Minds, and uh, he's, just, uh, he's just a fantastic, fantastic thinker and articulator. And guess what? He's written a book about this very subject, so that's why we're bringing him on today to talk about that. Charles, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Chris, for that. Um, and what a brilliant introduction to um, the, the uh, idea of behind the book, which is we're going to need a new system. <laughs> now, it doesn't have to replace the existing system entirely. It just has to be an alternative that people could choose if they so desire to. But I think um, what um, the idea behind the book is to take your oasis and other people's oases right? Like decentralized, anti-fragile, but connected, right? Um, With other like-minded people and create a system that actually makes it easy to do this. And right now you're having to start from scratch, basically reinvent the wheel, right? And then you're you're fighting a kludgy, broken, um, unfair, rigged system every step of the way to create a decentralized like community-based economy so my idea was well what would what would a system be like if we designed it from scratch to actually make it easy to join a community economy and so the book's title is a hacker's teleology and you go well that's interesting but what does it mean (laughs) and so uh it means um that a hack is like a life hack. That's, it's not like a bad thing. You're, you know, there are hackers who try to break in and, and control systems and so on. But originally the word hack meant a workaround. You got a kludgy system that's not working and you don't have the time, money, energy, you know, to create a whole new system from scratch. You're gonna have to find a workaround. So that's why I say it's a hacker's teleology. What's a teleology? Well, a teleology is, is like the destination where we're gonna reach if you connect certain dots. So what are the dots we want to connect? Well, we want a system that's opt-in and uh, voluntary, not like the one we have now. We want it to be fair, not like the one we have now. We want it to have its own money supply that comes from the bottom. Money's created at the bottom of the economy, not at the top. And we also want it to be human. In other words, like that, that it recognizes the value of dignity 
uh, contributions, meaning purposeful work and the needs of the community, things like that. <clears throat> well, if you connect those dots, you end up with um, the system that I've proposed. That, that's the teleology part of it. Then the last, the subtitle is sharing the wealth of, uh, of our shrinking planet because uh, we're, we all know it's a finite world we're on and the resources are being depleted. And so we're gonna have to make some sort of concerted effort to um, share this somewhat equally, at least not as unequally as, as it is now. And so to me, the obvious solution is take your oasis, multiply it by 100,000 oases around the world that's connected to a global community economy. And that's much more likely to be sharing the wealth because we're all sharing the same value system, which is degrowth, becoming more efficient, becoming more localized, not wasting resources and not chasing um, profits as the only uh, incentive in the system. So a hacker's teleology, I like that. Thanks for explaining that because um, that definitely helped me understand what it is. And uh, so let me pick up one piece of that, um, the fairness piece. I think that one of the most obvious things about being a primate, uh, to be biological about this, is all social creatures actually are wired for fairness in some way, shape, or form. And if we're in a deeply unfair system, people's, uh, you know, any organism's attachment to that system begins to wane, right? A deeply unfair system is not a really fun one. I think if, if you took any six-year-old and you just completely rigged the game of Monopoly, so they lost by the eighth turn of dice, they would stop playing very quickly, right? Um, you know, and so, so that idea, though, that we have deeply unfair institutions, my question to you is, is that just, a, is that just a, an automatic place where humans end up? And if so, is there actually a system you could design where it just doesn't end up there again? Right. I think that's a key question because history seems to suggest that it always ends up in a hierarchy with, um, you know, entitled, uh, privileged folks at the top skimming the, the wealth of the system. And, but I think technology gives us a little bit of leverage here um, because it's now introduced us to systems that we could design. In my terminology, you take a value system and you, you create processes that lead to that those values being um, the goal. <clears throat> and in the past, that process could always be convoluted or it could be corrupted by, by people, right? Like that's the, our political system. It's, it was designed, I, you know, in an idealistic fashion, but it's, it's easily corrupted because everybody in the system um, can, be, can be bought. So, but if you're dealing with a software system, um, that's open source, um, that everybody can see how it's programmed, but it doesn't allow you to do anything but um, do what the system's designed to do, then you really, um, you've limited the opportunities for human corruption. <clears throat> and um, people say, well, that sounds like a dream. Is that possible? And I, and I, and I think about systems um, like, uh, that we use all, all the all the time, like large systems, if, if they don't have to have any bias, like if you want to be an eBay buyer or seller, you join and then that's it. You know, I don't think um, the system is rigged to one ethnicity or one religion or anything like that. They just, if you follow the rules and you get good ratings, then there you go. And so if we took a system and we said, we're only collecting this data, your name, your ID number in this system, and the reputational reviews of your peers. That's all we're gonna collect. Well then, where's the, where could there be any bias? <laughs> we don't have any information on which to base the bias. And if no one is in charge, if it's a self-organizing system, then there's nobody at the top to corrupt. And so I think it's pretty obvious to me that the way you get a fair system is, you don't make it a hierarchy. You make it a flat system that's self-organizing like like nature, like an ecosystem, right? And so um, if, you've, if you've stripped the system of opportunities for corruption and bias, well, then you're not going to have any. And of course, there will be people that try to game the system and so on. And so you have to kind of watch out for that. But if the system's designed without any gigantic holes and it only collects this minimal data, then there really isn't much opportunity for bias. And so I think AI could be applied to to De developing a completely unbiased system instead of maximizing profit. But, you know, um, I know that's uh, my voice is lonely at this point in time, but I think 
that idea that AI could actually serve us instead of us serving it <laughs> could, could catch on. <laughs> well, it, 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 let's be clear. AI has been principally uh, directed and used at this point to make money, right? So Twitter uses a very advanced AI system to determine what I like to see, what I don't like to see, what's going to ultimately lead to the most engagement. And it's just parsing through my every mouse hover and scrolling speed and all these other parameters to sort of figure out where am I slowing down? What am I looking at? And then feeding me stuff with the idea that, that I'll click on something that makes somebody some money, right? So, so that, that's all in service of money. You're saying we could use AI potentially in service of humanity because let, let me be clear about something. Every money system enforces some behaviors, punishes others, right? It's an incentive system. And so a debt-based money system has some really powerful incentives baked into it. I think from my perspective, I, I, I cast judgment on it. I say it might have been a great idea in 1913, you know, probably made sense up through the 40s, but it's been making less and less sense ever since. And now we're in the, 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 the part of the story where it's ab you have to literally be insane to try and make sense of what the Federal Reserve is up to and the rationalizations for it, right? So, so we're, we've gone crazy over the tips of our skis uh, in our attempts to um, perpetuate and maintain a system that's pretty much outlived its usefulness. You say there's another system we could bring in on this and, and AI could, could actually be part of that. Right, right. For instance, um, this, my, uh, my basic idea, which I've, I've often posted in my uh, essays on, on peak prosperity, is if you don't change the way money's created and distributed, you've changed nothing. Right. You can talk about reforms and, oh, we're going to do this and noble sounding stuff. If you don't change the way money's created and distributed, you change nothing because you know, people at the top have all the money and they can buy whatever they want. Um, Jeffrey Epstein, a perfect example, right? You want to get into Harvard, um, the, the top echelon? Oh, just donate $10 million. And then pretty soon you're, you're the, the greatest buddy of everybody in Harvard. Um, so that's the way the system's rigged now. So my thing is we got to start a new system of money and cryptocurrencies give us that option for the first time we can actually say we're going to create digital money like the fed does out of thin air but we're going to we're going to create it in only one circumstance to pay for labor that was considered valued by the community mm -hmm. and so if you did some useful work like say on your um you're creating a network around your homestead if somebody um, in that network you're creating did some work that was beneficial, then they would get, they would get paid and, and the system would monitor their activity. It would verify that they actually did the work so that they, they couldn't cheat and say they did it, but there's no verification. All this is pretty straightforward stuff. Um, and then the money would be created and it would be limited because human labor is actually limited. <laughs> You know, the, the Fed has no limit, but human labor, there's only so much of it, even on a planetary scale. So the amount of money that we're creating is going to always be limited. Meanwhile, it's producing goods and services. So therefore, there's something in the system to buy. So there'll be some use for the money. Uh, so that's, that's kind of my scheme. And um, I consider it obvious, which is, of course, dangerous because... <laughs> uh, What's obvious to me is not obvious to anybody else. And so one of the things I tried to do in my book is explain my own life history. Like I've, you know, I've been working for 50 years and I've had a lot of different jobs like a lot of other people. And so I, as I've encountered injustice and unfairness and bias and, um, and the rigged nature of the system, it, it's, that's, those experiences helped me realize, well, we got to start with these fundamentals, right? Yeah. So the fundamental is we need a new, a new kind of money that, that's, that's created at the bottom of the pyramid, not at the top. Well, as I said, every money system enforces some behaviors, punishes others. Uh, I feel like farmers get punished in our system the way it's currently configured, right? And having spent more time around farmers now, because I'm, I'm trying to do some farming stuff, they are the most unbelievably gifted, hardworking people I know. They, they are their own animal husbandry experts. They are their own crop specialists. They uh, understand nutrient cycling. They can weld. They know how to build a house. They know how to fix stuff. On and on and on. They have to market everything. Like if you wanted to say, like basically they are everything, soup to nuts from production to sales, you know? Um, and, and so it's a pretty comprehensive sort of a thing. And, and it's very hard work. And by the way, they're some of the least well compensated people I know. 
Uh, so it, our money system basically punishes that, right? And keeps squeezing towards an outcome which says all these smaller farms fold up shop because it's just impossible. Kids, you know, look at that lifestyle, aren't drawn to it, go to do something else and they become specialized in something. So Johnny leaves the farm, becomes a lawyer. Sally leaves the farm, becomes a, you know, a doctor, whatever the story is, right? And then meanwhile, the, the big corporations start buying up all of this land and, and, and doing what they do you know, in terms of industrially mining the soils and distributing stuff for the least amount of, you know, cost. All fine, but you can see in the story, what we're gaining something, we're losing something. We're gaining cheap food, we're losing uh, multi-diverse, very skilled people who are highly, highly resilient members of your community because they know how to do so much. So what you're talking about is a system of money that begins to reverse that process. Right, exactly. And just in, in um, your example is, is um, is excellent because it, it's, it allows us to talk about fragility and anti-fragility, right? To use Nassim Talib's concept. And so um, we, since we're talking about food, we all know in the recent uh, you know, COVID uh, fallout, one of the things that happened was the, um, the handful of meat packing facilities. Uh, when one is shut down, suddenly the whole system is revealed as incredibly fragile because this is what happens when you concentrate wealth and power and productive capacity in these small numbers of, of corporations and small numbers of facilities. And so, and I also want to say this is global. What you're talking about is, is equally true in Europe. Small farmers have been eradicated or squeezed out of existence in Europe as well by the same industrial scale of oil based agriculture right and um, the average age of farmers in japan is i think it's over 75 now <laughs> i mean it was over 70 now i think it's pushing the pretty i mean the, there's not going to be anybody left that knows how to grow rice mm -hmm. you know because that's the incentives as you say in the system and um so if we look at the fourth turning and where it's going to take us we i think it behooves us to start thinking about not just what we want but how do we instantiate those goals, those values in a system that has the incentives that um, are going to reward, you know, anti-fragility and actual productive, you know, uh, labor in behalf of the community in some way. And we disincentivize um, unearned privilege, uh, rigging the system, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and of course, what you and I know and, and the Peak Prosperity audience knows is all of the money that that, that everyone's chasing so um, blindly is all going to um, go away one way or the other, right? <laughs> and so um, we're, we're going to have to start thinking about a form of money that we control or that's um, not controlled at the top of a uh, corrupt, um, self-serving hierarchy. So, and, and people look at Bitcoin and, and the problem with Bitcoin is it's not earned by labor. It's earned by uh, computer time, right? Basically electricity. And so um, that's a good model for how cryptocurrencies, that's one model, but I'm saying you don't need that. You don't need to mine a cryptocurrency. You can create a cryptocurrency that's based on labor. And, and um, just because nobody's done it doesn't mean it's not possible. So uh, help, me, help me understand how it works. So let's imagine somebody comes over and they, they're, they're going to they're gonna, you know, tend to my cows for a day. They do a great job at it. How do they get paid? Right. So um, the way that I've envisioned the system is there has to be a group. The group is actually the one that organizes the work because a single individual um, isn't, isn't going to be able to, to do the work. And it's not going to be um, that one individual needs to be part of a group because the group can organize larger work and it can also have an organization that's democratic, right? Because we've got to be able to say, well, who gets to decide what's, what labor is valued and which one isn't, right? And the software can manage some of that, but you need to, so you need to start a group. So the way that my system is envisioned is the, the, the person that wants to help you with your um, livestock says, you know what? There's a shortage of people that know how to you know, uh, work with livestock in this, uh, in this community. So I'm gonna start a group of people who are gonna um, take care of livestock in, in the community, you know, as needed, right? We don't necessarily own any, but we're going to help other people take care of theirs, that kind of thing. So then you, they'll follow the software, which has like step-by-step -step things. Okay, 
it's a democracy, so we elect a, um, you know, a, a leader for a year and so on and so forth. And then, and then we start organizing the work. And then um, you, you have to track the work. And then when you're done with your week, then you have to fill out the software and say, I performed these um, you know, jobs at these places. And here's photos from my smartphone, um, which by the way, you can have a, a $15 smartphone, right? You don't need a $400 one. I mean, there's really cheap models in India and China. So you, you, send, you, you upload some information that verifies you did the work and then um, you look in your account and hey, you got paid. Now you can start spending that um, and every community has its own um, kind of like uh, mini Amazon in the sense that everybody's goods and services that they're willing to trade is on this, um, is on the network. So you can buy and sell stuff with your new earned money. That, that's how I envision it because um, with the groups, then groups can combine and they can do a lot more work. Um, groups can stay small. I mean, it's infinitely flexible um, depending on the needs of the community. And so I think, um, and if you've been in groups, and I've been, spent a lot of my life um, in groups, political groups, um, faith-based groups, um, companies, um, you know, so on and so forth, social groups, education, nonprofits, you name it. Of course, there's always a little, you know, friction, right? People are, oh, well, somebody's trying to, you know, run the meeting and so on and so forth. But if you have that experience, it's not too hard to design a system that rotates leadership, for example, and it, you know, that has a system of subcommittees. So the work actually gets done. And um, so I've designed a system that I think works based on my decades of experience in small groups. Yes, there's always going to be friction, but if you're working with purpose and meaning, you, you set all that stuff aside, you know, because you're going, wow, I'm contributing to something important, you know, and, and that's such an amazing feeling. And, and it's such a hit or miss thing in the system we have now. Very few people get to experience that. And that's just, that just shows how in, inhumane our system is. Indeed, well said. Um, I maybe should have asked this question earlier, but uh, you know, based on all your research and all your uh, writing and thought and thoughtfulness, um, what's, your, what's your sense of, of the direction of things at this point? Um, and you know, are we facing a lot more hard times? You know, I mean, you mentioned something sort of, you threw it out there. We all know our money system's going away. I can't imagine that without being just enormously disruptive, if not destructive to most people's lives, right? That, that's, a, that's a really painful thing uh, when, when your money system fails. Uh, are, are you saying that you're pretty sure our money system is going to fail? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think if we look at history and we look at systems, right? And of course, you're a systems guy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, people work in systems, you know, they, they exist in systems, but they, they don't necessarily understand that, um, that they all have processes and the processes generate output. And some systems, you know, can only generate a certain kind of output. So if, if that system is wired the way it is, you're only going to get one kind of output. And so if you want a different kind of output, you're going to have to change the system. Mm -hmm. So if we look at history, and I like to look at the Roman Empire because it's so well documented. That, that's the difference between, like, say, the Mayan Empire or the Tang Dynasty. We have some records, uh, of course, from China, but um, the Roman Empire is, is remarkably uh, well documented. You know, we have papyrus that was, um, that, uh, was in uh, Egypt, right, where it shows the exact accounts of, um, and the crew members of ships going to trade with so southern India and this kind of stuff. So we have a lot of detail. Well, their money collapsed over time, right? They did the same thing that we're doing, which is let's inflate our money because we need more of it. So let's um, debase the silver coin with, um, you know, lead and other stuff. And then, oh, that worked. So let's just do that some more. And then pretty soon there's, there's virtually no silver in it at all. And so um, that undermines the entire system, right? Because then people uh, don't have... Um, they cannot trust that the money is going to have the value a year from now that it did it does in the present. And so, um, and Rome was also struck by pandemic. It was in, uh, struck by um, invasions uh, and, and people wanting their own resources back <laughs> from the empire. Um, and so, um, and political infighting, you know, that the, the elites in Rome, um, we're more interested in, in, in fighting each other than in dealing with the, um, 
the enemies, the barbarians, which by the way, they weren't really barbarians. They just happened to be Germanic people that were in the empire, but there was a built-in bias against them. Um, and so by the end of the empire, uh, all these, these fragilities took the system down. That's how I would put it. That the empire had once been anti-fragile and all those sources of anti-fragility um, er eroded, unraveled, or, or were corrupted. And so then what was left was only a fragile shell. And I think that's, that describes the US economy, political system, and social system to a T. It's like a fragile, hollow shell, and it's not gonna take much for it to implode. And since all these things are connected, um, you could have a political crisis that takes down the money supply, you know? <laughs> because, uh, you know, if there's political pressure to, to give us all a million dollars a month, well, then that's a quick way to destroy your money supply right there. So whenever in business you're facing a, a, a problem or a predicament like this, you're, you only have two choices, do something, do nothing. Um, and so, so for a lot of people, I think it's sort of the do nothing, might as well wait, you know, see what's happening. What you're talking about uh, in your new book is, is that uh, it's time to start thinking about, for the people who are interested in the do something side of things, uh, it's never too early to start thinking about stuff. And by the way, let, let me be very clear, Charles, uh, no matter how badly it collapses, in, let's imagine it collapses really bad. Money system, just total wipeout, supply chains break down, death and destruction, all of that. Nobody's thought anything through. Eventually, we're going to see that, that uh, an economy and a money system emerges again, because that's how humans are. Uh, every, every tribe, you, you know, every society you look at has somehow found an expression for money, some way to store wealth, some way to uh, do that, whether it was giant stones with circles in it or cowrie shells or you know, um, hides of animals or it was silver or it was gold or pieces of paper. It always seems to happen, right? So, so uh, I like the idea, though, that you're saying, well, let's talk about this. What would we want? And I can give you a lot of not this in my own story. My, I, I'm, I, you know, this whole COVID thing, really, I have to confess, I, as jaded as I am or was, I was nowhere near jaded enough for this particular story when I saw um, our health officials not recommending simple, cheap, effective things because of money, because, because they wanted pharma companies to be able to sell more of their latest fancy stuff, right? That level, that disconnection from the basic humanity, that's not a world I, I have any interest in preserving. I don't want to tweak it. I have no interest in figuring out how to make it slightly better. I'm a burn it down kind of guy for a lot of that stuff. Um, it's just, it's unfixable. So I think there's enough people listening to this though, who also aren't that way. I, I actually think we've been co-opted by a very small select group of people who are sociopathic, if not psychopathic, full definition, right? Um, in, in, the, in the DSM. Uh, but for people who are interested in doing something and are caring and have some compassion and want to, um, want to begin figuring this stuff out, what I hear you saying is it's, it's time to start doing the hard work, right? It's not too early to begin lifting this because two outcomes, we do nothing and the economy crashes and all that. And the, the, the recovery from that could be kind of, when the Romans left Europe, it was like 400 years. People are like, we don't know how to make a heated bathhouse. That was really cool, but we kind of lost the, the technology. We had gone, you know, for a long time. But if we had something in place and we'd thought about it and we'd started working in small groups and gone through that reconnection process and that friction that always happens as people try and come to a shared understanding of something, uh, that if we can do that work now, we'll be in such better shape to at least have, at least we're not starting from nothing um, when the rebuilding comes. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Chris. That's the main point of my book is, okay, look at it. If you've got a better system and you've sketched it out in greater detail than, than mine. Hey, put it out there. We all, wanna, we all need to start looking at, at some alternatives. And so the, the basic model, the infrastructure that I'm, I'm talking about is basically like a Linux or a Mozilla. In other words, you look at these things um, that basically started with one, um, a very small group of people started coding something and then other people got interested and they started contributing. And it wasn't for let's become billionaires. And it's all like, we assume, oh, well, if no one will do any work if, unless they're, they're going to be a billionaire. And it's all like, well, actually, humans are wired 
um, to contribute and be want to belong to something greater than ourselves, right? And to earn dignity by by sacrificing with another group that's that's got a purpose. And so um, these systems like Linux show that you actually can design a software system which is global and robust with just people contributing to an open source system. So again, I, I think a lot of people are going to look at my ideas and go, well, that's just airy fairy kind of stuff. And it's all like, well, no, actually cryptocurrencies do exist. And, and actually, if you know, the more you know about cryptocurrencies, and I'm not an expert, you realize there's a bunch of different platforms that have nothing to do with mining um, uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. There's a lot of other models out there and they already exist. And there's a lot of open source systems, which are global, like Linux and Mozilla, that are not owned by a corporation, aren't run by a sociopath at the top. Um, here's talking to you, Warren, Bill, um, Jeff. Um, <laughs> um, and so it's, it's entirely feasible. And, so, um, and yet it's beyond what any one of us can do. And so it's going to take something like where a group of people or some idealistic person who's um, uh, now guilty about the, the hundreds of millions they've skimmed off the system to say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put like a, a, a t some kind of tiny amount of money, like 10 million bucks behind this idea, <laughs> see where it goes. And, and so I don't know what, how or what that's gonna work. It could be a faith-based organization goes, yeah, you know what, this is, these are the principles of our religion so um, let's um, see if we can help this idea get, get going, you know? Um, I don't know how that's gonna work, but somebody somewhere will pick up the threads and then there'll be, hopefully, there'll be a political will that um, a revulsion against another uh, corrupt, um, exploitive, parasitic hierarchy and, um, and there'll be a political desire for a decentralized, anti-fragile system that everybody that can benefit everybody that's um, a participant and not just the few at the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do you think, um, uh, how, how do you go about getting people to sort of engage with this sort of idea? Uh, I'm beating around the bush. You know, Charles, there's a lot of people out there who've gotten kind of used to not working, not working yeah. hard. Um, maybe don't even know how to work or work hard because uh, they haven't actually done it yet in their life. So I'm interested that you started, or there's at least a part of your book that says, here's who I am. And I'm sure when I read it, I'm going to say, oh my gosh, look at all the things you've done. You, you probably sheetrocked a wall and put some wiring in and, and you know, built something and run a business and on and on and on, right? Which collectively gives you a, a framing that says it's hard work, but, it, but it's doable. Persistence and, and, and thoughtfulness can get you far. Um, is, are there enough people who understand those values and have that experience to, to pull this off? Do we have critical mass here? Yeah, great question, Chris. And again, it goes to your point about, um, incentives, right? This, what are the incentives in the system? So, um, obviously, uh, you know, humans are generally like, if we can use fewer calories and, um, get more calories, we'll do that. Right. So mm -hmm. if there is still a government, uh, giving away free money, and, there, and you can use the money to buy a bunch of stuff, then no one's gonna join something like mine, right? Uh, not no one, but fewer people will, right? Because there's some alternative. But when that system breaks down, just like the bread and circuses in Rome, and, and here again, perfect example, um, the wealth of the empire was squandered on circuses, right? These enormously expensive things with a lot of bloody action and um, feeding hundreds of thousands of people, giving them free bread, in the city of Rome, which had basically been shipped across the Mediterranean from North Africa I mean, at enormous expense. I mean, entire fleets of ships had to be built and maintained in order to feed the quarter million of people who got the free bread. So that system was super fragile, and so was the system supporting the whole Roman infrastructure. So when it break, breaks down, then what? Well, you don't no longer have an option of getting the free bread. <laughs> There's no more free money. So now what do I do? Well, then you have a different, you know, set of choices. So my system is not going to really catch on until the free bread and circuses have gone away. Um, and um, at that point, then people will start making different decisions and they'll say, well, gee, I really want to eat still. I still want shelter and I can't get that on my own. So I'm going to have to make some other choice. And so then it's going to be, you know, 
uh, joining the brigands, um, you know, the thieves in the forest. <laughs> or you can lay down and die, or you're going to have to join some other group. And in, and in the Roman, the post-Roman era, then um, in the Western Empire, um, then you could join a, a, a group of people serving a monastery, you know, or something like that. Or you could join um, a Germanic army. <laughs> so there was always options. And it's just like, the question is, are you going to create one or are you going to have to join one that's um, another, you know, rapacious, uh, parasitic hierarchy? Because, of course, there's always going to be those around. There's always going to be somebody that's going to try to recruit slaves or serfs and um, to do work for them and, and skim the money. So uh, what I'm saying is if there's an alternative that's better, then people will eventually choose that. And I think what I really like about my idea is because I've worked in a lot of different jobs, not everybody's super talented. There's a lot of people who um, have physical or mental um, uh, disabilities, and yet there's always work for people. You know, In other words, you can tend to animals. Um, you can kind of watch the kids. Um, you can sweep the sidewalks. I mean, there's a lot of work that's actually useful that doesn't require, you know, the kind of uh, in, insane drive and, and uh, brilliance that, that, we, that we think of as, well, you have to have these characteristics to do something useful. It's like, no, there's a lot of, uh, most of the work on, that's performed on the planet is actually very simple, <laughs> you know? And so if we started paying people for doing that work that's useful, well, then they'd have money and they wouldn't, they, uh, they might actually find that they like belonging and being needed. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, Warren Buffett uh, had a great quote uh, that he said, uh, when he hires people, he's looking for three things. He, he's looking for energy, intelligence, and integrity. And he said, if they don't have the integrity, they'll kill you with the first two. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so... And so this brings me to a comment I have about AI. So, so I'm, I'm of two minds, right? Um, on the one hand, I don't like how it's been used, right? Because it's mostly been used to sort of hack people's, in the bad way, hack people's wiring to, to sell crap, right? I, I don't think that's a great use. The other mind that I hold on it, though, is that we've now created a world where there's 8 billion people, give or take, and it's too complex. It's too complex for ordinary human wiring to, to get through, right? Like, like the, we, have, we have AI now that can land a rocket on a barge in the ocean, right? There's no human pilot that can do that, right? So in an equivalent sense, AI could be that thing. If we're going to pierce through, if technology is going to come with us for the ride, we're going to have to find a way to use the AI to help us manage things that we no longer can manage for ourselves because we're too slow, we're, we're too, you know, um, irrational, whatever the story is. So that's a place where I could see AI coming forward and it, and it, and it kind of full circles. Like why did, why did people behave, why was people's behavior of higher integrity and more constrained a long time ago? Well, it's because they lived in a village of about a hundred people and you couldn't get away with anything because everybody was in everybody's business. AI is kind of that thing now, right? If you, it, um, I think the anonymity of, of the uh, sort of the citification, you know, the, the anonymity that people had. Uh, here's what all I know is that when people have anonymous personas on the internet, they act badly. <laughs> so, so to the extent to which, you know, the system now becomes, you create a system where people are no longer anonymous. And given that though, and if everybody knows that's a fair system, everybody has to play by the same rules, then people want the next layer up that which they want that meaning and purpose, right? And once they achieve that meaning and purpose, it builds on itself and, and, and it goes from there. But you have to, you, you, can't, you can't have nothing at the base. That's what I'm trying to, you know, that's what I feel like our culture has for a lot of people. Nothing at the base. I work at Wendy's or McDonald's or Burger King and there's just no meaning or purpose to this and it feels unfair and, I, and, I, and so therefore you never make it to the next level on that story. Right, right. Um, you're, 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 you're so right about that, Chris, because we can call that upward mobility or social mobility where, um, you know, ideally, every human being um, has, an, has a path to something better. Now, that could be a lot of different things depending on each person, right? Um, and so does, this, does our system enable that? And we look at the people who rise to the top and we go, oh yeah, we live in a meritocracy. But actually, as you're kind of pointing out, the meritocracy window is narrowed so, to such a tiny 
uh, hole now that even getting a PhD doesn't guarantee you some kind of secure, well-paying job, even mm -hmm. in the sciences, right? I mean, so every ladder that people had and were told, oh, climb this ladder and you're going to have upward mobility, all of the, every ladder has been broken, you know? And so now it's like this um, almost impossible to get ahead. And also to get ahead as an individual, like in other words, it's not just about making more money. It's like, how do I fulfill my potential or my talents or my interests? And so in our system, I, I call it, it's just hit or miss. Like some people succeed in doing it, but the majority don't. And so what I was thinking is, well, why don't we have a system that more or less guarantees the opportunity, not the outcome, but it, 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 it guarantees the opportunity. Mm. Um, and so to talk, go back to your thing about AI, I think what we're talking about is, are we serving AI or is, or is AI serving us? And if AI is just serving us, then it would, it would be used in something like my system. <laughs> uh, where, it, as you say, once it's controlled by corporate hierarchies or, 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 or government hierarchies, then we're serving it because it's just a, another tool of exploitation and uh, predation. So. Um, Will there be a, a change in the values um, of society um, after the, you know, the, um, the complexity goes away? And I think, um, I think people, as you say, people want fairness, but they don't know how to get it. Hmm. And so they're, they're enraged, right? They're frustrated, disgusted, enraged, and hence they want to just go break some windows, right? That's what we're, we're in that stage now. So what I hope is whether it's my idea or somebody else's idea, it's like we need to have something that people can look at with hope, right? And say, well, actually, yeah, that system would work. That would work for me and it would work for the, the, my community and it would work for the world. Well, let's, let's talk about doing that, you know? So, um, and I, I consider that very likely, actually, you know, um, if we can get it out there, you know? If we can get it out there. Well, it's in Hacking Teleology and so... Mm -hmm. I would advise people to get that book. Charles, how, how do, how, and be personal about this, how do I get my hands on it? Okay, well, um, I, I, uh, if you go to of2minds.com, I've, I've assembled like an excerpt, uh, a series of excerpts from the book. So you can read the, you know, a pretty good chunk of the book for free. And then you can decide if it's of any interest to you. And then you have to order it through the company store, <laughs> otherwise known as Amazon. <laughs> because I can't get, um, nobody will publish my book <laughs> except if um, the way that, I'll just give you a quick, um, most readers don't know this, but if you go to a small publisher, they're going to take most of the money and then they're going to put your book on Amazon just like you would. <laughs> Only you don't get any money and you no longer own the rights to the book. So when they stop publishing it, um, you're out of luck. So um Anyways, I, I, uh, I have my same reservations as everybody else about the company store. <laughs> but at this point, um, that's the only way I can get my ideas out there is through the company store. So you have to go to Amazon and buy it. Amazon. All right. Well, that's, that's where you find it. And of course, you get the excerpts at Of Two Minds. Um, so uh, check that out, everybody. Uh, Charles, thank you so much for writing the book. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm, I'm really actually personally very interested in it because um, I'm going to be, this could be a test bed here. You know, we're, we're setting up a, a whole interesting thing is going on here on, on the, on the homestead, you know, so we have a community developing. It feels really good. We've got a bunch of people. Last night was a fascinating night um, because we were presenting a bunch of ideas to the town uh, planning board and they loved all our ideas. It was a big love fest. Um, but afterwards it just felt really good because we had uh, 12 people who are now assembled around this idea. So it's, it's my brain is already turning to, uh Oh, we already have a community. What, what, you know, what's the container for it? What are the rules? How are we setting this up? You know, what, what, what behaviors do we want? Like I'm just already there. So maybe we could find a way to implement some of this. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, just in closing, I think all my ideas to take what you and Evie and your colleagues are doing, and um, rationalize it, you know, like make it a set of rules that somebody could log into something and create a group just like yours, at least the infrastructure of it and, and the rules that would keep it going in a positive direction. And they could, they could get into that without having to reinvent it. And so 
that I think would be hugely powerful. If, and so you might be able to do that. Uh, just a simple kind of web based thing where anybody could start a group similar to yours. Now it may not be as effective, you know, or in the same field or whatever, but just to have that model, you know, and a, and a, a step-by-step thing would be huge. So that's basically my idea at, at the smallest level. And, and then you can say, well, gee, Chris, if you had this model and somebody as in, in, in the Congo or South Korea could log in and create the same kind of group, that would be, um, pretty neat, especially if there was some way they could connect and share ideas. Well, indeed. So, um, well, that's what, that's what the next year is going to be about is really starting to gel things like this. So, uh, anyway, we'll stay in touch around that. Thank you so much for your time today. And thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure to talk about my work, <laughs> but I, I, um, I, I hope it's, it's not so much my work. It's like ideas that, that we can all, um, go beyond, you know, at least it's a starting point. I heard you loud and clear. This is, it's time to kick off the conversation. You kicked it off. So consider it started. And I'm like you, uh, you might have the best idea out there and that'll be great. And if there's a different, better one that comes along, that'll be great. I'm just, I, I think this is the stage of history where we're just going to have to try, try, try. I'm, I'm a rapid prototype, iterative kind of guy, right? So, yeah. So, you know, you just, there's so much more value in, in getting things started and kicked off and at least moving than there is in, in uh, analysis, paralysis, and all that other stuff. So we got to start trying some of this stuff. It's kind of 11 and a half hour. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Chris. Well, thank right. you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks. The pleasure has been mine.